Welcome to the new Porsche Cayenne GTS. Now, before we get to the fire, fire and the condiments sprinkle on your food, let's have a look at why we are reviewing this at all. You see, I know some of you will be yawning at yet another SUV thinking just buy an estate, and I'm kind of with you. But stick with me, partly because the fire bit is quite interesting and has nothing to do with SUVs, and partly because in the context of the modern motoring landscape, SUVs like this are still, I'm afraid, really important. Porsche sold 280,000 cars globally in 2019, and around 190,000 of those were Porsche's two SUVs, the Macan and Cayenne. The larger of the two sold 86,000 units, and that's not including the newly introduced Cayenne Coupe, which sold 7,500. That puts it some way short of BMW's X5 at 170,000, but ahead of the Range Rover Sport, 82,000. It was also the best-selling of its VW MLB Evo platform stablemates, just beating Audi's Q7, well in front of the VW Touareg, and leagues ahead of the Bentley Bentayga and Lamborghini Urus. So, the Cayenne remains very important for Porsche. The Cayenne GTS sits between the Cayenne S and the Cayenne Turbo, so it's potentially the sweet spot of the range. The original GTS had a naturally aspirated V8, then it went to a turbocharged V6, and now we're back to a V8, but we've kept the turbochargers. Numbers, 454 brake horsepower, 457 pounds foot of torque, from about 1800 RPM. Nought to 60 miles an hour in 4.2 seconds, if you spec the Sport Chrono pack. So, quick enough. Quite clearly though, you don't buy the GTS just for the extra numbers. You buy it because, well, with the V8, it sounds rather good. You get a sports exhaust, and they've also deleted some of the sound deadening at the back. So if we put it into sport, which wakes up the sports exhaust option. It sounds pretty good. I still don't think it matches Mercedes four liter turbocharged V8 for sound, but mellifluous nonetheless. As standard, the right height has been dropped by 20mm and the suspension uses steel springs. However, this particular car has the optional air suspension. In fact, we have got really quite a lot on this car. You see, as well as the air suspension, you can also spec rear wheel steer, which we've got, uh, PCCB, so you can actually have two other options of brakes. So you get steel as standard, then you can have the tungsten carbide, the ones with the white calipers, or PCCBs, which we've got, which are the carbon ceramic brakes. You can also get PDCC, which is Porsche Dynamic Chassis Control, which is basically the active roll system. And this car has got an upgrade of wheels from 21 inch to 22 inches. All in all, a car that started out at £85,000 is now up to £113,000 in this spec. Inside the GTS, well, you get lashings of Alcantara, which I really love, to be honest. It just sets the right ambience as soon as you get into the car. As soon as you touch that lovely soft material on the steering wheel, it makes me happy. The rest of the interior, well, it's sort of as almost shy and retiring, almost boring compared to the exterior and its lava orange of this car. And talking of hot things, let's talk about this Porsche's name. Cayenne is, of course, a type of pepper. It's also the capital of French Guyana, but let's not get into that now. And if I say pepper, you say, no, not pig, salt. Obviously, salt and pepper. And we thought we would bring pepper to salt. Let's ignore the fact that it's not black pepper, it's cayenne pepper, which is slightly different. But anyway, molden salt is the most famous type of salt. And that comes from just over there, the Blackwater River. Blackwater is actually a corruption of brackwater, as in brackish. Anyway, they produce the best stuff to sprinkle on your food. And it's been around since 1882. It's family owned by the Osbournes. And if you want to know what's special about it, well, there's less magnesium in it. And you can see that it's actually little pyramids. They also coined the phrase sea salt flakes. So now you know. Might just be the most tenuous link I think I've ever done in a film. But there we are. You've learned something new. Pub quiz and all that.
By the way, if you were looking at the boats behind me and wondering what the maximum wading depth of a Cayenne on air suspension is, well I can tell you it's 520mm, 20mm more than an old Defender. It can also tow up to 3,500 kilos, so you can trailer your dinghy, or that jet ski you won on a game show in the 90s. Talking of practicality, this has got 772 litres of boot space with the rear seats up, which is pretty enormous. That's about 130 litres more than an E-Class Estate. Slightly less than an E-Class Estate when you put the seats down, but still 1,700 litres is pretty massive, which is what you'd hope for if you're buying this sort of thing. One of the slightly old school features in here is having this gear selector, which I rather like. Changing gear with this, it's been quite fun. The actual shift of the 8-speed auto is merely okay in terms of snappiness, but it's just rather fun having the option to pop up and down the ratios with the lever rather than the paddles. It makes me bemoan the little toggle switch you get in a 992 even more. It just makes it a bit more involving. If you put things into Sport Plus, then it gets even more <laughs> extraordinary in terms of the grip, but there is a sense that it's just trying to bludgeon the road into submission. Weighing 2,145 kilos, it's never going to be balletic, this car. Impressive, yes. Interactive, not exactly. <laughs> In fact, how I've enjoyed it most is I've got the individual setting on the engine ramped right up and then the chassis in its more relaxed setting, so you've got that bit more fluidity in the suspension. It's a, something you might have noticed I kind of like doing with cars where it does let you tailor it. And that seems to be the most fun because then you can actually just work with the road a bit more, use the fact you've got the extra suspension travel of an SUV. The engine does need to be revved. You've got to keep it certainly above three, ideally above 4,000 RPM. It makes its power at around about 6,000 RPM, so it does reward being revved, which is quite nice, actually. The steering is nice and accurate. It's obviously not the best Porsche steering, but it's still pretty good. You can feel what's going on at the front end. You just have to manage the weight over the nose, though. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is fuel consumption, but I've got a particular location in mind to talk about that. Down there is what remains of runway one at RAF Bradwell Bay. Now this is a station that was built in the Second World War and has been disused really since 1946. But what's really interesting about it is that this is the only RAF fighter station to use Fido during the Second World War. Now Fido is not a dog. Fido is the Royal Air Force's Fog Investigation and Dispersal Operation, or Fog Intensive Dispersal of, if you prefer the slightly more Yoda translation of the acronym. Now, in the Second World War, they had real problems with fog, and specifically, I suppose, smog, because of all the coal they were burning, all the heavy industry. And that was a problem, certainly because the pilots couldn't take off, but more importantly, because they couldn't land. Now, they came up with a system which I think demonstrates the sheer sort of extravagance and ingenuity of the Second World War. What they did is they laid two pipelines either side of the runway and they pumped kerosene or petrol into them and then they lit them. Sometimes a man would do it, sometimes they'd hang out the back of a jeep and just have a long taper effectively. Once you had the lines of fire up and running, it would disperse the fog in about six minutes because it just burnt off the water vapour and so the planes could come in and land safely. It saved thousands of lives. They were going to implement it at Heathrow after the war, but the trouble was it was just too expensive because somewhere like this would use about 450,000 litres of fuel every hour. Some bigger places would use up to 800,000 litres. Now, if we assume 450,000 litres, this has a 90 litre fuel tank, so that's 5,000 tanks of fuel for a Cayenne GTS in one hour. Now, if we go with a 
range of about 400 miles because we're assuming 14 litres per 100 kilometre which is about just over 20 mpg in this. That is enough to do 2 million miles in a Cayenne GTS. And that's being pretty pessimistic. If we assume a lifetime of 100,000 miles for a Cayenne GTS, you could have 20 Cayenne GTSs running for their entire lifetime off the fuel burnt in one hour from Fido. Pretty extraordinary, I think you'll agree. Today, well, this whole site is going to be taken over by a new nuclear power station, replacing the one just over there, which is a bit of a shame, really. So what to conclude about the Cayenne GTS? I feel slightly conflicted about this car, really, because, as I've said in the past, these sorts of things, there is a certain guilty pleasure. I mean, it sounds good, it goes down the road incredibly impressively. It's hard not to fall for some of its charms. But what I kept thinking is that, really, perhaps in the same way you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, you shouldn't judge a vehicle by its press car spec. You see, the trouble with this in the spec that it's in is that, well, you'd never take it off-road, would you? I mean, look at the carbon brakes for a start. You just wouldn't, wouldn't risk it, would you? Nearly £7,000 worth of brakes do not want to meet with mud and gravel. And yet, with the air suspension and its various terrain modes engaged, the Cayenne can be surprisingly capable off-road. And it seems a shame not to be able to tap into that. Denuding it of that off-road ability is a bit like buying a convertible and then welding the roof shut. So instead of trying to spec this up like some sort of track toy, because let's face it, really you're never going to take this on a track, why not make the most of the fact that it is still an SUV, the point of it being an SUV rather than an estate, and actually fit the smaller wheels, perhaps some tyres that can do a little more mud plugging than what's on here at the moment. That way, you've got off-road capability, but with a great sounding V8. The ability to charge across a field with this soundtrack, that I like.